click here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about my recent work on a multi-dimensional generalization of the erdos turan inequality and how this can be applied to study the stability of some attractive repulsive energy minimizers. This is a joint work with Jiuya Wang from University of Georgia. Uh, so uh, to begin with, let me first uh, give a brief introduction of the erdos turan inequality. Uh, so this inequality it describes the following phenomena, which can be very easily observed by a, a simulation. So what I did here is that I take some uh, polynomial of a relatively high degree uh, with random coefficients plus or minus one, uh, and I plot the rules of this polynomial on the complex plane. Uh, and you can see a very clear phenomena that uh, first of all, most of the rules uh, are very close to the unit circle. And the uh, second, which is the most interesting thing is that they basically uh, distribute uniformly around the unit circle. So this is exactly what is uh, dictated by the erdos turan inequality. So uh, to formulate this inequality, uh, let me use the following notation. We consider a complex polynomial f of z whose coefficients are given by a k, k running from zero to n, so n is a degree. And we assume that the constant coefficient is non-zero so that all the roots are non-zero. So for each complex root, uh, I can write it in the form of a magnitude and an angle. So here, the magnitude rj is some positive real number. And the angle theta j, if I write the, the two pi here, the theta j becomes uh, some number inside the interval zero to one, or in other words, uh, in the one dimensional torus. So roughly speaking, uh, the erdos turan inequality says the following. Uh, if your polynomial f is somehow small on the unit circle, then uh, we have the two conclusions that we have seen before. One is the rules, uh, most of the rules will have magnitude close to one, that is close to the unit circle. And another conclusion, the most interesting one is the angle distribution of all the rules is almost a uniform distribution. Okay, so to formulate uh, this angle distribution uh, issue in a precise way, we need two things. One thing is, what do we mean precisely by the polynomial being small on the unit circle? And another thing is, what do we mean by the angle distribution is almost uniform? So to describe the uniformness of the angle distribution, uh, uh, one concept that people usually use is the so-called discrepancy. So assume that you have a lot of rules uh, which distribute exactly uniformly along the unit circle. This basically means if you take an angled region, say the angle from alpha to beta, and you count how many rules lie in this angled region, the, then the number of rules lie in here should be proportional to the length of the interval alpha to beta. So uh, on the other hand, if you have some non-uniform distribution, then you can imagine uh, in some interval, the, the rules are like very concentrated so that if you do the same thing, you will get more rules compared to the uh, length of the interval alpha to beta. So if you take this number of rules normalized by the total number of rules and minus the length of the interval and take the maximum over all the possible intervals like that, this is the concept of the discrepancy. In other words, uh, if the discrepancy is small, it tells you that the rules are almost uniformly distributed in the angle direction. And for the size of the polynomial on the unit circle, actually there are many different choices. So one particular choice uh, by the uh, original paper of Erdos and Turan 
uh, is the so-called height functional. Uh, basically, this is like taking an L infinity norm of the polynomial on the unit circle uh, and normalized by uh, some of the coefficients and then taking a logarithm with uh, another normalization. Uh, so uh, once we have these two concepts, we can formulate the classical result of Erdos Turan in the 50s uh, in a precise way. It says that uh, the discrepancy is bounded above, above by a constant multiple of the square root of the height. In other words, if the polynomial f is small on the unit circle, that is the height is small, it tells you that the discrepancy has to be small, which means the rules are almost uniformly distributed in the angle direction. Uh, so here, one interesting thing is you see a very interesting scaling. Here you have the discrepancy is related to the height functional to the power one half. And it turns out that this scaling is sharp. Uh, and after this work by Amoroso and Mignot in the 90s, uh, the only thing left here, non-sharp, is the constant. And uh, in my work with Wang, we, we figure out that constant, sh the sharp constant here to be square root of two. Okay, so uh, you see this early Turan inequality already has a history of 70 years and uh, many works have been, de have been uh, de devoted to uh, this early Turan inequality. Uh, for example, uh, there have been some previous uh, efforts on the improvement of the constant over there. Uh, and also people have tried to use like different height functions or instead of doing the unit circle, uh, you can also consider a similar height function on a different curve. Um, and uh, there, are also, there is also some multi-dimensional version of the Erdogan inequality in earlier works. And later on, I will mention that uh, how th this is different from uh, what I will discuss in this talk. Uh, and also people have tried a different type of uh, discrepancy functional. And uh, also I will discuss this in detail later. Uh, and by the way, let me also mention that uh, there is also an interesting application of the Erdogan to run inequality in the content uh, of algebraic geometry. Okay, so, uh, to make this uh, early Turan inequality into a, a better form, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, formulate it in a continuum setting up. So you will see that this will be convenient for many different purposes. So to begin with, uh, let me uh, first say that uh, a very classical observation by Schur, uh, which is even earlier than the early Turan inequality itself, uh, says that you can always reduce to the case when all the rules have modulus equal to one. This is because uh, if you have a, a situation where this is not satisfied, then you just keep the angle distribution and uh, replace every root uh, with the same angle but modulus equal to one. This operation, of course, this will not change the discrepancy at all because the discrepancy is only about the angles. But uh, a very simple argument will tell you that the height function is always getting smaller. So that means we can always reduce to this case. And in, in this case, it turns out that the problem looks much better uh, because if you look at this height function, uh, if all the rules are equal to one, of course you can do a, a rescale the polynomial by a constant so that your leading coefficient is one. Then this tells you that the constant coefficient is also equal to one, which means the denominator is gone. Uh, and then you basically just have the maximum of uh, the f of z. And the polynomial f of z is just uh, equal to the product over j of z minus each root. So if you take uh, the modulus, uh, you, you can just uh, take the modulus on each of the linear terms. And here the root zj is just uh, some complex number with modulus equal to one. Okay, so once you have that, you see uh, here you have a logarithm of a product. It's very natural to uh, exchange them so that we have a summation of the logarithm. 
So uh, now you see this is a very clear convolution structure. This means you are just looking at the, basically the same function. And for each value of j, you translate it by theta j, and you take an average of all of them. So this function is exactly uh, this w of x uh, with a sign flipped, uh, which I will call a potential function. Uh, so uh, if you view that at the some, uh, some kind of interaction potential, then it means that if you define the empirical measure by putting a Dirac delta at every of the, uh, at every root, I mean, in the angle variable, then this whole thing inside just becomes the convolution of the uh, potential gener of the interaction potential uh, with the empirical measure. So here I I'm taking here uh, as a minus sign so that the maximum be becomes a minimum. Uh, this is because uh, from a physics point of view, uh, this kind of pairwise repulsion is more reasonable because if you consider some interacting particles, if you have re repulsive particles, then they tend to uh, distribute in a quite uniform way. But if you take attractive, they just come together, which is not, not very interesting. Okay, so this means by introducing this interaction potential W and uh, the empirical measure rho, I can uh, just rewrite the height functional in terms of uh, the basically negative the minimum of the generated potential. Okay, so uh, fortunately the discrepancy function can also be written in terms of the empirical measure rho. So this, this means if you take some interval i in the angle direction, uh, that is some interval on the one dimensional torus, if you want to count how many rules are there, you are just integrating the empirical measure row inside this interval. Uh, and the length is just the integral of the constant one. So it takes the supremum of this integral uh, over all the possible intervals, you, you get the discrepancy. So a continuum of formulation of the order to run inequality is that uh, instead of taking just the, the empirical measures of this form, we can do a completion and consider all the probability measures. Let's say for any probability measure row on the one dimensional torus, we always have the discrepancy is bounded above by this sharp constant uh, times square root of the height. Okay, so it is uh, uh, not very hard to show that this continuum formulation is equivalent to the, the discrete formulation just by some uh, approx like approximating a general probability measure by empirical measures. Uh, and it turns out that the continuum formulation is much easier to deal with. Uh, for example, one aspect is in uh, another of our work, uh, which figure out the, the sharp constant here. Uh, you can see that if you want to figure out the sharp constant, you are just trying to minimize this quotient function now. And it turns out that if you do this continuum formulation, uh, in certain sense, this functional will have a minimizer. And if you write the explicit formula for that minimizer, you, you immediately get the sharp constant. This cannot be done uh, in the setting up of in the discrete setting up because if you only consider empirical measure, you will not find that minimizer. So that's one application of the continuum formulation. And I'm going to, today I'm going to talk about uh, how the, the, using this continuum formulation, we can, uh, it's very natural to do a multi-dimensional generalization of the order to run inequality. Okay, so if you look at this inequality again in the one dimensional setting up, uh, you see the discrepancy is bounded above, above by some norm of uh, the convolution of W convolved the row, that's the generated potential. Uh, so you can view that in the viewpoint of stability. That is to say, uh, it is not very hard to see that W convolved rho equals to zero will imply that rho has to be the uniform distribution just by taking the Fourier transform because uh, uh, just for that particular potential W, uh, the Fourier coefficients of W will be positive. Okay, so, uh, 
Once we have this implication, it's very natural to ask a question of stability. That is to say, suppose I perturb our assumption a little bit. Let's say if we assume that W convolved the row is small in certain sense, can we somehow say that the conclusion is also approximately true? That is, your row is close to the uniform distribution. So the, the original erdos turan inequality is exactly saying that if W convolved rho is small in the sense of height, then the uh, rho is close to the uniform distribution in the sense of discrepancy. So if you look at the erdos turan inequality in this way, it's very natural to do generalizations. Uh, for example, like, why only this potential w, interaction potential W, we can consider much more general W. And why we have to do that in a one-dimensional torus, we can do that in multi-dimensional torus or even more general spaces. And why do we only consider this kind of discrepancy and this kind of norms? There are just many ways of doing the generalizations. So uh, let me first discuss one aspect uh, we have to deal with if you want to do a multi-dimensional generalization. What do you mean by the discrepancy in multi-dimensions? Uh, so you see the original definition of the discrepancy utilizes the concept of an interval. You take the supremum of all the intervals of this integral. So in multi-dimensions, there are many different ways of generalizing the concept of intervals. For example, you can do a similar concept of discrepancy on certain test sets. For example, you, you can do that on, let's say, all the balls or, or all the boxes or even more general sets. You, you can do all these kind of definitions. And it, it turns out that previously there are some existing work uh, generalizing the erdos turan inequality using this kind of generalized discrepancy. But it turns out that this result uh, doesn't behave so well in the sense that uh, all this kind of scaling will depend on the, uh, what kind of test the sets you allow. For example, if you allow balls or you allow all the boxes, possibly very long, then the conclusion will be very different. So uh, in my opinion, a more general way is uh, to use the Wasserstein distances. Uh, this is based on an important observation by Graham uh, two years ago, uh, which uh, who observed that in one dimension, the discrepancy of rho is equivalent to the Wasserstein infinity distance between the uniform distribution uh, and the rho. So uh, this Wasserstein infinity distance uh, has a very general, uh, has a very natural generalization to multi-dimensions. So, uh, if you are not familiar with Wasserstein infinity distance, then let me just give a very brief introduction. Uh, so this is the Wasserstein distance. Basically, it's a, a, a very uh, classical way of uh, defining the distance between two probability measures. Let's say if you have two probability measures, rho one and rho two, on any so this can be very general. You, you, you imagine a uh, multi-dimensional torus or just Rn. So you can imagine that if you want to measure like uh, how far they are, then you can do the following. You define a transport plan, let's say pi of x and y. This means if I want to change row one into row two, I can do the following. I imagine row one is a pi of sand and I move every the piece of sand from the location X to the location Y. And how much you want to uh, move from this location to uh, X to location Y, this is given by uh, the function pi of X and Y. So to make sure that this operation is indeed moving row one into row two, you need uh, this kind of marginal conditions. Okay, so uh, to define the Russell sign distances, uh, you imagine that doing this kind of transport has a cost, and this cost is related to how far you, you have transported from X to Y. And of course, you can define this cost function in many different ways. And a typical way is to do an LP type cost function. You say, if I move from X to Y, then the cost is uh, X minus Y, uh, uh, taking the power P. 
Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, you, you integrate against your transport plan, uh, you get your total cost. Okay, so now you want to design a transport plan to minimize your total cost. And this minimal uh, cost will be the Wasser and P distance, depending on uh, what power P you choose here. Uh, and if you take uh, a limit P goes to infinity, you get the Wasser and infinity distance. Uh, so this basically means uh, for a transport plan, the cost is given by the farthest two points you have ever transported. Okay, so uh, then we are ready to formulate our generalized erdos run inequality using the Wasser's and infinity distance. Uh, so assume that we are in uh, a d-dimensional torus uh, and we consider a probability measure rho. Uh, then uh, our theorem says that the Wasser's and infinity distance between rho and the uniform distribution is bounded above by constant multiple of the following. Uh, you take some uh, interaction potential Ws. Here, uh, this Ws is a periodic risk potential, which is uh, defined by saying that the Fourier coefficient uh, is a power law function. Okay, so we take this interaction potential W and we take the uh, uh, convolution with rho, which, is, which gives the generated potential. Uh, then uh, this rather than infinite distance is bounded above by this generated potential taking a general LP norm uh, with P in this range uh, to a particular power gamma given by this expression. Okay, so uh, you can see that we generalize this concept of discrepancy into multi-dimensions by the rather than infinity distance. And now we can allow a general class of interaction potential here, uh, not just the logarithm, logarithmic potential. And in particular, this allow different type of singularity of the interaction potential near the origin. Uh, and also we can consider a different type of LP norm instead of just an infinity norm. Uh, and you can see that uh, there is also an interesting scaling here, uh, which depends on the dimension, uh, the LP, and also the singularity of the potential near the origin. Uh, and it turns out that this scaling is optimal and we have explicit ex examples which achieves this scaling. Okay, so before I discuss the proof of the theorem, uh, let me first give you one application of the generalized error to run inequality on the stability of interaction energy minimizers. So this kind of interaction energy is, uh, it often appears in many setting up uh, ranging from physics to biology, biology and the social sciences. Uh, so basically you consider some probability measure rule and you uh, uh, view them as particles and it, every pair of particle has an interaction energy, which is given by W. Then the total, uh, interaction energy is just the integral of W convolved rho times rho. Okay, so you can rewrite that uh, by using the Fourier coefficients because that's the inner product of this convolution with rho. And on the Fourier side, you use Planchard rule to get, uh, this is like W convolved rho Fourier coefficient times rho Fourier coefficient up to a conjugate. And the, the convolution becomes product on the Fourier side. So you finally get just the summation of W hat rho hat squared. So you can see that for this kind of uh, positive definite potentials, that is if we assume that the Fourier coefficients are positive, uh, I mean, other than the uh, K equals zero frequency, then the uniform distribution is a unique energy minimizer because you see this expression is always non-negative and it is uh, equal to zero if and only if your rho hat uh, is concentrated at the k equals zero frequency, which gives you the zero energy. And of course, once you see that the energy minimizer is unique, it is very natural to ask for a question of stability. That is, if your energy is close to the minimal value, can we say that uh, your probability measure has to be close to the minimizer. 
Okay, so this is a consequence of the generalized error to run inequality. We assume that this uh, uh, positivity of W hat is quantitative, which is bounded below by this kind of uh, power loss. Uh, then uh, we can say that uh, we have this kind of stability. That is, if your energy uh, is uh, of some probability measure row is small, then it implies that uh, your row has to be close to the uniform distribution in the sense of Wasserstein infinity distance. Okay, uh, so uh, from the generalized error to run, it is quite easy to deduce that basically, uh, if you consider just the risk potential case like, like that, then uh, you can write uh, the total energy in, in, in this form because W hat is just a power law. Then you can combine this uh, uh, power of K into your row hat so that this is something squared. You see on the frequency, on the frequency side, if you have something uh, squared taking a summation, this is just originally something taking an L2 norm. And it turns out that it is a generated potential using a slightly different uh, risk potential. Okay, so now you apply the generalized error to run inequality uh, with the L2 norm here. And uh, this risk potential, uh, then you get exactly this stability. Okay, so. Another consequence in terms of the stability of energy minimizer is the stability of uh, stability with respect to potential perturbation. Uh, this is to say, suppose your uh, interaction potential comes from some modeling and this kind of modeling may involve error. You, you care about the issue that if for one particular interaction potential you get, you prove that the uniform distribution is the energy minimizer. What if your uh, interaction potential has an error? If your interaction potential changes a little bit, will your energy minimizer changes a lot or not? Okay, so this is a stability with respect to the perturbation on the potential. Uh, uh, as a consequence of the generalized error to run inequality, it says that suppose your W has this kind of positive definite property and you do a perturbation on the potential, then uh, as long as your perturbation is small in the L infinity norm, any energy minimizer of the new interaction potential has to be close to the original minimizer in the Wasserstein infinity distance. Okay, so this is a very important property uh, from the uh, from a realistic point of view, uh, and uh, I will not show you the proof, but uh, starting from here, it is uh, basically just uh, several lines uh, by playing around with this energy and the original energy. Okay, so uh, let me show you a, a very interesting example about the application of this, this version of the stability. So uh, suppose we take uh, originally just a, a raised potential with some power S and we do uh, the perturbation of the interaction potential in a very particular way. That is some kind of rescaling of a smooth profile. And we do this perturbation with epsilon very small. That is we, we do a perturbation very close to the origin. Uh, if you do the calculation of the Fourier transform, or the, I mean the Fourier coefficients of this potential, you will see that the uniform distribution cannot be a minimizer because there are some negative Fourier coefficients. If you look at this expression, if there are some negative Fourier coefficients, then there are definitely some ways to make the total energy negative. If the uniform distribution gives you energy zero, uh, in, in this case, the uniform distribution cannot be the energy minimizer. Okay, but on the other hand, this perturbation uh, is small if uh, our epsilon is small. So our previous result tells you that even if the uniform distribution cannot be exactly the uh, energy minimizer, any minimizer of the new energy functional cannot run too far. It has to be close to the uniform distribution in the Wasserstein infinity distance. So that's what we see in the 
uh, in a numerical simulation of those energy minimizers for the W tilde epsilon. So suppose we just do the raised potential, you see that uh, the minimizer is basically just a uniform distribution. If we do this kind of perturbation with a relatively large epsilon, you'll see a very clear clustering phenomenon. And there are the formation of this kind of clusters uh, in the energy minimizer. Uh, as your size of epsilon gets smaller and smaller, you can still observe this clustering phenomena because you know the uniform distribution cannot be the energy minimizer. But the interesting thing is this clustering phenomena is happening at a smaller and a smaller scale. So as you make the size of perturbation smaller and smaller, it is actually converging to the uniform distribution in a weak topology. Or in other words, uh, this result tells you that it has to converge in the sense of Wasserstein infinity distance as the size of perturbation goes to zero. Okay, so uh, finally, let me come to the proof of the generalized order to run inequality. So our proof is uh, motivated by an earlier work by Sandra Rajan, uh, who uh, did uh, an improvement of the constant for one particular version of the one dimensional order to run inequality. So what he did is on this uh, L1 version, of the one dimension order to run inequality with exactly this logarithmic potential. So the idea is like the following. Somehow, if you look at the discrepancy functional, this tells you that if the discrepancy is large, then there has to be some interval i such that your row is very concentrated uh, on this interval compared to the uniform distribution. Uh, and uh, you can say that this integral is just the integral on the whole torus, but now I include a characteristic function times rho minus one. Okay, so finally, uh, we are going to use Fourier transform and this characteristic function is not smooth, which makes Fourier transform not very well behaved. So his idea is, to do a modification of the characteristic function in a very particular way. So you take this interval i and you expand it by some small radius r. And this r will be taken as proportional to the discrepancy. Then you, you take the characteristic function of a slightly expanded uh, interval and uh, convolve it with a modifier of the same radius. So that guarantees that your new test function G as a modified version of chi i will still be equal to one inside i, but outside there is a little region of width r such that it goes to zero smoothly. Okay, so that means if, if you look at here, you are only perturbing this chi i a little bit. Originally it is d of rho, then after this modification it is still bounded from below by a constant multiple of d of rho. Uh, and then uh, uh, it is uh, not very hard to uh, also give an upper bound of this uh, integral uh, by using Fourier transform because you see it is like the inner product of two things. On the Fourier side, it becomes the inner product of g hat and rho hat. Uh, and later on, I will explain uh, in a more general setting up how to deal with uh, this estimate. So once you can estimate that from above uh, by utilizing this uh, LP norm of the generated potential, then you can see that discrepancy bounded above by the generated potential, that's the order to run. Okay, so you see that this proof relies heavily on the discrepancy formulation. If you do a Wasserstein infinity formulation, you, you don't see the interval i, so how can you play with this trick? So this is our main innovation uh, uh, for the Wasserstein infinity distance, which is a discrepancy type formulation of the Wasserstein infinity distance. So we prove that for any two probability measure, uh, row one and row two, 
Uh, actually, we, we stated it on the D dimensional torus, but it is actually true for much more general sets. Uh, the vaster than infinite distance between these two probability measures is equal to the supremum of this kind of thing. Let me explain this in details. So suppose you have some set S such that row one is very concentrated in here compared to row two. In the sense that even if you expand the set a little bit by a radius R, the mass of row one inside S is still greater than the mass of row two in this larger set. So suppose you have this situation. This is kind of an obstruction to construct a cheap transport map from row two to row one. Because if you want to construct such a transport map, you, you need to at least fill in all the mass of row one inside the set S. Of course, you can use the mass of row two inside SR, but the mass of row two here is not enough. You have to utilize something outside SR uh, from row two and move it into S to fill in the mass of row one in S. And you see this transport from this point to this point will take you a cost of at least R. So that means once you have this situation for some radius R, that uh, the Wasserstein infinite distance is at least equal to R. Okay, so uh, this gives you uh, the greater than or equal to in this theorem. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if you consider this, uh, all this kind of possible obstructions and take a supremum over R, you directly obtain the Wasserstein infinite distance. In other words, here you also have a less than or equal to. This is a, a, a less, uh, it's a more difficult conclusion. And our proof is we first uh, make a discrete version of that using empirical measures. Uh, and then this basically becomes a graph theory problem because uh, to find a, a transport map from uh, an empirical measure to another one, it is just uh, trying to find uh, a, a perfect matching in a fiber head graph. You can view uh, the point masses of row one as the one vertex set, one vertex set, and the point masses of row two uh, as another. If you allow certain whether it's an infinity cost, then you are allowing several kind of edges in between. Uh, so the more costs you allow, the more edges uh, you have. Uh, and once you allow enough uh, cost, then uh, you're able to find a perfect matching that is exactly a tra transport plan. Uh, and uh, when can you find such a perfect matching? This is uh, related to the Hall's theorem uh, from graph theory, which uh, exactly have this taste. That tells you that as long as you don't have an obstruction like two vertices is only connected to one. If you don't have this kind of obstruct obstructions, then you can always find a transport plan. Uh, and uh, this is how we uh, did the theorem in the case of empirical measures. And in the general case, we just do approximations. Okay, once we have this discrepancy formulation, then it is very uh, natural to generalize uh, the uh, proof of Sandra Rajan into the multi-dimensional setting up. Uh, basically, if you are given uh, some row with, uh, 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 with a given uh, whether it's an infinity distance with a uniform distribution, then you can always find uh, some set S such that row is concentrated in the set S compared to the uniform distribution. That is to say, if you take R as proportional to this rather than infinity distance, then the integral of rho in S is greater than the integral of the uniform distribution on this expanded set, uh, expanded by a multiple of R. Okay, then we just take the, the same kind of uh, test function and get a lower bound. So basically, uh, 
Here we, we take a three R in this layers. And in the test function G, we only expand the original set uh, by R. So that means your G is just uh, uh, supported uh, inside a layer of, inside a layer of uh, radius R. Uh, inside a layer of radius 2R, because we also take a modi modifier here, which expand another R. Uh, that means uh, if you take this uh, test function against the row minus one, uh, what you gain is uh, this layer from 2R to 3R. Okay, so this is uh, how we get to the lower bound. And you see that this lower bound is more or less related to R, which is uh, rather than infinity distance. Uh, and then let's see how to do the upper bound. For the upper bound, we, we first uh, take this thing and use a branch rail to go to Fourier. Uh, remember that finally we want the right hand side to have the generated potential taken on LP. So at least we need to create the uh, generated potential. So anyway, this G is a convolution. So in the on the Fourier side, it becomes a product. Okay, it becomes a product if you want the generated potential somewhere on the uh, right hand side, then we have to create it. The generated potential is like W convolved row. On the Fourier side, it is W hat times row hat. We just create it and divide it. Then if you want the LP norm, uh, okay, you, you switch back to the physical side. Uh, whatever inverse Fourier transform of this complicated thing, I will explain in a minute. And then on the other side, you, you get the correct W convolved row, right? Uh, and then you just to try to move all the complications into this term. Uh, and here you, you just use a holder inequality to create the W convolved row LP. Okay, you see this W convolved row LP, this is good. Uh, so now the only problem is how to estimate this term. Okay, so uh, to estimate uh, this term, the first observation is uh, that uh, we can, uh, you see that this is the inverse for a transform of these two things, which means it is a convolution of two things. Uh, one, one is the inverse for of this fraction and another one is just a, a characteristic function. Uh, and for the characteristic function part, uh, you can use a Young's inequality to uh, get it away. Uh, it becomes the size of the set SR to some power. And whatever left is uh, the LQ norm of the inverse for a transform of this fraction. So our W hat, that's just a power law function. And that's a, from the risk potential. And Psi is a fixed uh, modifier. So this term is something independent of all the row and all the sets we have involved. Uh, and uh, to estimate this in the best scaling of R, this is kind of uh, a very standard problem in harmonic analysis. Basically, you go to the Fourier set and do a very proper cutoff and estimate inside, outside separately. You can get this correct scaling in R. Okay, so this is how we do the upper bound for this complicated term. So finally, if we combine all, everything together, the, here we have the lower bound. And here, this is the complicated thing times uh, the LP norm of the generated potential as the upper bound. So finally, we have lower bound and upper bound. Uh, okay, so this is more complicated in the one dimensional setting. Uh, you see, uh, this is not exactly R, but somehow related because you see, this S3R to S2R, this is some layer of uh, uh, of thickness equal to R, right? So somehow this is proportional to R times the surface area. Uh, and on the right hand side, they also have an annoying term, which is the size of the SR. This depends on the set S. So you see that somehow this term is related to the surface area and this term is related to the volume. So how do you relate the volume and the surface area? Of course, by the isoparametric inequality that tells you that, okay, if you uh, fix the uh, volume and want to minimize the surface area, you take a ball, right? 
that gives you the correct scaling between these two things. And actually, uh, if you uh, do a like layer version of the isoparametric inequality on the torus, you, you get the correct scaling with these two terms related. So that almost finishes the proof uh, because finally you combine these two terms give, giving you R scaling and this is also R scaling. You get R to some power related to the LP norm. Uh, but there is just the one little issue is here you have the S2R and here you have the SR. There is a mismatch between the two things. And in principle, if you're at a bad situation, this may create a huge error because if your S has a very complicated fine structure, then when you do expansions, the, the surface area of the SR may change dramatically as your R increases. Uh, so to handle this issue, we introduce a very technical regularization on the SR. Basically, uh, we try to do the things like when we consider the SR, you start from some set and you first expand it and then uh, take the complement and expand it back. So this operation somehow makes this the set larger uh, and it, it exactly fill in all this kind of bad details of your original set S which makes the set uh, SR much more well-behaved. So in this case, after the regularization, you can show that the original argument still works, but now you have uh, the different layers of the expansions are comparable so that you can uh, basically ignore this mismatch issue. Okay, so finally, let me just uh, explain how we get the sharpness of the scaling. So uh, basically, if you want to prove the sharpness of this, you just need to do a construction of rho uh, such that this Wasserstein infinity distance is of order epsilon and uh, uh, this uh, right hand side uh, has exactly the correct power of epsilon. Uh, okay, so. Uh, then you just want to say, okay, I, I take this uh, rather than infinity distance as says epsilon. I want to make this uh, norm of the potential as small as possible. If uh, if you do that and get the exactly this scaling, then you are done. Okay, so a natural way of constructing some probability measure whose rather than infinity distance with the uniform distribution is epsilon. It's the following, you just take uh, some ball of radius epsilon uh, and you shrink everything uh, towards the center to form a, a Dirac delta. That, that thing will have rather than infinity distance epsilon from uniform distribution. Okay, so this already solved uh, several cases, but not all the, not the whole range of the parameters. Uh, somehow the issue is that if you consider this generated potential, you, you are trying to make the, some norm of it as small as possible. So basically, if you take this kind of row, I mean, this red thing, uh, inside the, the range of order epsilon, there is nothing more you can do. Uh, it is what, what it has the scaling what it should be. But outside, your, your W is smooth away from the origin. If you consider W convolved the row outside, it has a tail. Uh, and since your W is smooth, uh, basically how small the tail is, like uh, how fast this power law decay is, depends on uh, how many vanishing moments you have for this probability measure row. If you have more vanishing moments, the decay will be faster. That means uh, if you are doing this very rough way, uh, you are preserving the total mass and the center of mass, but nothing more. If you want to do more, uh, what you can do is uh, you kind of taking a modified version of that. Uh, and on that particular profile for your row, uh, you, you take some Laplacian on that. The more Laplacian you take, uh, the more vanishing moments you have. And actually you can make this decaying tail of W convolved row as small as you can. 
And finally, if you do that with a sufficiently large capital M, you can make sure that the contribution of the tail is negligible and you only see the contribution inside the epsilon ball. And that's uh, how you uh, obtain the sharp scaling in the most general cases. Okay, so that's all for my talk. Thank you. And thank you very much for a very nice talk. Yeah. Let us send the speaker. And, and please, some questions, comments, or remarks. Um, okay, maybe I have a small question. Uh, you considered on the torus TD, and you also mentioned that it's possible it's possible to do for other manifolds. Uh, for which manifolds do you think it would be easy to do, or maybe some uh, For other manifolds, uh, let me see. So I think, uh, let, let's say compact manifolds, okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Or for example, a high dimensional sphere. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, if you want to do that on higher dimensional manifolds, the biggest difficulty is uh, how you do the Fourier transforms. Uh, okay. Because you see here, we have a lot of structures uh, like using the Fourier transform and also this kind of convolution structures. Uh, so I think on the sphere, it might be possible because you have all those spherical harmonics, right? And mm -hmm. on the sphere, if you do an integral integral operator, which is uh, whose uh, kernel is axisymmetric, then there is also a very similar formula like that. So I I believe it is possible, but for more general manifolds, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, for more general, it probably will be more complicated to do some calculations or some estimations like this. So. Yeah, I think. I mean, this estimate heavily relies on for transforms. So if, if you do some um, more general manifolds, maybe you, you can say, I take the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, uh, try to do similar things, but I, I'm not sure whether it works so well with this kind of modification arguments. They, they have to be somehow compatible. Yeah, thank you. Um... Maybe, uh, some, maybe some maybe some other questions, comments, or remarks. I I had um, a question. It's a couple of slides back uh, about the uh, the bound for the uh, the uh, the the infinity of Wasserstein distance. Uh, you had you had that it was equal to um, some. You had it that it was equal to some maximum. Right, the de depending upon where the mass was inside or out of the set between two measures. Oh, that's uh, you mean here? Uh, no, it was. It would have been. It would have been later on. It was. It was. There was. Um, it. It was. It was. It had discrepancy in the title for the slide. I think it's. So, okay, you mean? Oh, maybe I, I. Maybe I had this backwards. Yeah, there. Yeah. This. This one. Um. Hmm. So. So. Uh, this 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 theorem that that they, that you have, um, presumably this isn't something that would only work on the torus. Um, do you know how general uh, this this theorem is? Like, uh, what? I think at least for compact manifolds, this would be true. Is there any reason to think it wouldn't work for? general compact metric spaces or uh, for more general metric spaces uh, I think it, I mean if you only look at the empirical measures uh, you can do that basically on any metric spaces mm -hmm. but the problem is uh, on your set, whether a general probability measure can be approximated by the empirical measures uh, in the Wasserstein infinity sense. Basically, that, that's the issue. I see. I, I believe not every manifold, uh, not, not every metric space is, you can do that. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's so. So this this is a this is a this is a new result you just recently found. Uh, yeah, we found that when when we try to prove the theorem, and I mean, we, without this thing, there is just no way to deal with the Wasserstein infinity distance there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Sure. No, that's 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 really cool. That's really interesting to know. And and I'll to okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. that. Thank you. Uh, maybe some other questions, comments, remarks. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for the nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you have similar um, results for P by search thing with finite P. Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, I have seen some uh, recent results. Uh, one is by Steinerberger uh, on Wasser SMP version of the uh, order to run, but I I remember his result uh, is um, still one dimensional. Uh, and then, uh, let me see, I think uh, his result is also one dimensional and also just one particular uh, LP, which is related to the Wasser SMP. Uh, related to that P. Mm -hmm. So uh, somehow uh, uh, what are some P distance uh, as general as this kind of formulation that I, I don't know any result like that. So somehow uh, it's still this story, like the Sorry, too, short, too, too, short, too short, too very short comments on this uh, that might simplify. We do have a couple of results in high dimensions as well at sort of compact manifolds at great level of generality for W2. Okay, W2. You, 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 that's a, in a paper with Lewis Brown. And the other comment is that W infinity is in some sense the hardest one to work with, right? It's the, it's the most sensitive, it's the most delicate. So the, the fact that they have these wonderful results for W infinity is very good because W infinity is the most informative in a sense. Yeah, so uh, you imagine that you have a result on W2 distance. Uh, so did you use like, like uh, Benamou Brainier formulation, something like that? Uh, no, 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 we use uh, Green's functions and the equivalence to H dot minus one. Oh, okay, okay. So it's more like the auto calculus. <laughs> Okay, uh, and it's in uh, multi dimensions. Uh, it's even on, on compact manifolds. So okay. that, that turns out to be pretty general once you, but you have to use the Green's function on the manifold. Otherwise, uh, you can't do much. Right? Uh, okay, okay. So thank you for letting me know that. So, anyway, somehow the Wasser sign distance, just by its original uh, definition, is not very easy to play with. Uh, you have to have some kind of other formulation. So I think for this kind of formulation there, I remember there is also a, a kind of a dual formulation for the general Wasser sign P distance, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to use that to do a dot to run. It's kind of not, uh, as clean as this one, you just deal with a set. It is like a, some kind of test function with two variables, and it's not very easy to use that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I had another question. Uh, near, near the beginning of the talk, you were saying that there were some results that we're doing this specifically for discrepancy, like either with the uh, boxes or with balls. Um, yeah. Uh, how how do those compare to, or how, or did you find any way in which they relate to your results? Yeah. So I didn't really go into many details of those results. Uh, but anyway, I believe that this water sign infinity, this kind of general, generally speaking, water sign distance uh, is, uh, it's, I think I, I'm more from the PDE community, mm -hmm. uh, uh, doing kind of models from physics, biology, and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I think water sign distances. Uh, much more frequently used compared to discrepancy in our community. Mm -hmm. So somehow we just believe that 
uh, we, we have to do a rather than distance version of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I add something? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, Jordi Marzo. So I would like to know if, uh, well, because there is also this other version of this Erdogan inequality in terms of another quantity on the right, no? Is a mean. Yeah, so the, uh, like a truncated for. Anything about the function in that case or? Uh, we tried to look at that, but I don't think that thing. Let me see. I don't remember the, the, the details of that, that version. And maybe let me just recall now. Because so at least this Sundar Arajan is, is on this other. Yeah, version. I see, I see. Uh, th th this one also has a, a continuum formulation. If you want to do that, so again, you can say that uh, in multi dimensions, I mean, in multi dimensions, uh, if you take the weather sign infinity distance between row and the uniform, uh, can you bound that above by some kind of truncated Fourier series summation for your measure? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, let me see. I think this may be possible, but our current proof will not work. Uh, at least not work directly. I'm, I'm not sure like whether if you modify it a little bit. Uh, so anyway, you are going to deal with the Fourier transforms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the point is that uh, instead of doing this here, you just say, this is basically the same as dividing by k to a powers. Uh, and here you somehow need to do a, a truncation on that. Uh, and you have to have an effective way of, uh, let's say if you truncate it, Truncate it at uh, some uh, level n, then you have to have an effective way of estimating the tail in terms of n, like one mm -hmm. over n to some power, something like that. I'm not yeah. sure, but I think it, it, it is worth it to look at this into details. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it may, may be possible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, please, some other questions, comments? <coughs> okay, maybe it's not the case. Let's send the speakers again and maybe some questions come. <laughs> <laughs>